Welcome to lecture number 12 for ECE320, Using a Transistor as a Switch. Now, there's a couple reasons for using a switch, or electronic switch. Most microcontrollers or function generators, like 555 timers, have very limited outputs. For example, the PICs that we use in 376 can only do 25 milliamps. 555 timers can do, well, it depends upon the version, 2 milliamps for a CMOS 555. Uh, typically like 20, 50 milliamps otherwise. Many loads require more than 20 milliamps. So how do you drive a load like a 200 milliwatt LED that needs 100 milliamps? Or an atom speaker that needs 600 milliamps? Or a motor that needs 24 volts and 2 amps? The solution to that, or one solution, is to use a transistor. So starting out, what is a switch? <coughs> a switch there's many types of switches, like a mechanical switch you can use to turn on and off the motor. For example, here is a mechanical switch. I have the 12 volts going to my switch, going to a 12 ohm resistor to my LED to ground. As I close the switch, that makes an electrical contact, the light turns on. Open the switch, light off, closed, light on, light off. That's the idea behind a switch. <clears throat> and it doesn't have to be a light. I can turn on and off motors, speakers, whatever you want. There's a couple ways to connect it. I can connect on the high side. Basically, if the switch is open, like this right here, there's no path to ground, the motor is off. If I close the switch, I complete the circuit, and the light turns on, the motor spins. I can connect on the low side. Either way works. As long as I pick, break the path to ground, I turn the motor on and off, light on and off, speaker on and off. Okay, here's another type of switch. This also is a mechanical switch. When I close it, the resistance between these two wires goes to zero. Switch closed. Open it. Switch open. And I've got an ohmmeter. There's impotent resistance. Switch open. Zero ohms. Switch closed. Open. Closed. Open. Closed. So can I do that with electronics? Well, there's a couple ways to do that. This is a relay. What it is, is the same thing as this switch right here, but instead of mechanically pulling that switch up and down, open, closed, that's done electrically. This is an electromagnet. When I energize the coil, it takes this big piece of iron, pulls it over, that closes the switch. When I take out the current, the electromagnet turns off, opens up. So with an electrical signal, I can open and close the switch. That's mechanical relay, and you can hear it opening and closing. You can hear the little clicking when it opens and closes. Problem with mechanical relay is it's mechanical. It only has so many actuations, typically like 10,000. After 10,000 open and closes, the switch burns out. Can I do that with electronics? And the answer is yes, I can. Using a BJD transistor, I can turn on and off the motor using electronics. In this case, I can use an NPN or a PNP. The NPN transistor goes on the high side. The PNP transistor goes on the low side. That's my electronic switch. So that's what this structure is all about. How does this work? How do I design it? So let's start with the NPN transistor. If I have a circuit like this, from the previous lecture, I've got three states, off, active, and saturated. I've got a load line. If I have a 10 volt source, 100 ohm resistor, when the current is zero, I have 10 volts across VCE. This point right here. If I open up the circuit, actually if I short it, take a wire and short it, I've got zero volts VCE, and the current is 10 volts over 100 ohms, 100 milliamps. Connect the two points, that's the load line. As the voltage VCE varies, I move up and down the load line. In the active region, IC is beta times IB, or in some textbooks they call it HFE, IB. It's an amplifier. As I raise the base current, it get more and more and more. The collector current gets higher and higher, up until I get to here. If I command more than 100 milliamps, 
that what happens is I'm trying to operate over here with a negative voltage. That physically can't happen. A negative voltage means I'm producing energy, and a piece of silicon cannot produce energy. So I physically cannot go left of the y-axis. And actually, this switch is not perfect. I'm never going to get quite to the y-axis. The voltage will never be quite zero. It'll be close to zero, but not quite. So what we do in this class is assume I'm at 0.2 volts. The 0.2 is kind of pulled out of thin air. It's a number close to zero, but not quite. That's called saturation. If I command more current than is possible, I saturate at the maximum current, and the voltage becomes 0.2. That's what I want. That gives me my switch. At this point, I'm off. At this point, I'm saturated, or on. And the nice thing about that is the power dissipated is going to be zero. The power is volts times amps. Here, the amps is zero, so power is zero. The voltage is zero, or close to zero, so the power is zero. So this isn't going to really dissipate any heat. I can use a very small transistor and allow one amp to flow. Now, when you build a transistor amplifier, you need to operate in the off or saturated region. So this point is good, that's off. This point is good, that's on. And here, that's bad. That's the active region. The region is bad is this is volts times amps. I have the power, looks like this. This is the maximum power dissipated in the transistor. What happens is if I have a small transistor like this, if I operate in the active region, it's going to get hot. There's no place to dissipate the heat. And what happens is you get a melt spot on your circuit board. So if you ever see these in lab, that's what happened. Somebody had a transistor operating the active region. It got hot and melted the circuit board. So don't do that. Now, the strategy in designing a transistor amplifier is you have to know how much current you need. So that comes down to like when I close the switch, light turns on, motor turns on. How much current am I drawing? We tend to use two transistors in electronics, the 3904 and the 6144. The 3904 looks like this. I think that's probably a 3904 transistor. It's not designed to dissipate heat. It's designed to be used in digital electronics, on or off. The current gain is between 100 and 300. The max current it can take is 200 milliamps. When it turns on, base emitter is 0.7 volts, collector emitter is 0.2 volts, ballpark. And they're cheap. That's why we like them. The more expensive version in your lab kit is the 6144. This has a gain between 200 and 560. 0.7 volt drop, 0.2. 0.18 volt drop, a little more expensive. What's nice about it is this can handle 10 amps. So figure out how much current you need and decide which one of these you want to use. Preference for the 3904 because they're really, really cheap. If I need more current, 6144. You can also tell what these are designed for. This one's designed for 320 digital electronics. And I can tell because this can't dissipate heat. It can't operate in the active region. This one's actually designed for analog electronics, ECE321. And there I can tell because it's got this big heat sink on it. It's designed to dissipate heat. And that's what I'm going to need when I go in the active region. But this is 320 digital electronics. So let's look at how you design a switch. Um, starting out, suppose I want to drive a 200 milliwatt LED. The input, let's assume I have 0 volts, 5 volts, capable of 25 milliamps. So again, this could be a 555 timer. Uh, this could be a PIC processor. The electronics doesn't care. My output is an LED. It has a 1.9 volt drop and 100 milliamp current capability. Come up with a switch so that this turns on the LED at 5 volts, off at 0 volts. That'll be this circuit right here. The procedure to design it is first find RC to set the current and then find RB to turn on the transistor. So the first step, I want to pick IC, so this is 100 milliamps. The diode drops two volts. The transistor, when saturated, is 0.2, and close to zero, but not quite. So this is 2.1 volts. That means I have 7.9 volts across the resistor. 
7.9 volts at 100 milliamps is 79 ohms. So that's RC, that sets the current. For the base current, what I want is beta times IB to be more than IC. So if IC is the 100 milliamps and beta, let's just do worst case. If I use the 3904, beta is at least 100. So 100 milliamps divided by 100 is 1 milliamp. Pick IB to be bigger than 1 milliamp. Uh, but pick it to be less than 25 milliamps because that's all a pick can do. That's all a 555 timer can do. Number between 1 and 25, I'm choosing 2.15 milliamps or 2 milliamps. Once I know the current, I know the voltage. This is a diode. Voltage drop across the diode is 0.7 volts. So 4.3 volts at 2K gives you 2.15 milliamps. Doesn't have to be exactly 2.15 milliamps. I could make that 2K. As long as beta IB is more than IC, this will work. So that's an idea of an NPN switch. To check your design, I could check it in Circuit Lab. I can check it in hardware. If I go into Circuit Lab, I can build the circuit and measure the voltages. What I'm going to look at is VB, VC, and the current. VB should be 0.7. When I do a DC simulation, I can see that VB is actually 0 0.8002. Again, the 0.7 is a ballpark. The voltage drop across the silicon diode is about 0.7. This says it's going to be actually about 0.8, close to 0.7. The collector voltage, that should be 0.2. When I simulate it, I actually got 0.1657. That's good. That says this is saturated. Uh, point two again is pulled out of thin air, close to zero, but not quite. That's pretty close to zero. So this is saturated. The current is right here, 93 milliamps. 93.15 milliamps. A little bit off. The reason it's a little bit off is this isn't exactly point two. The voltage drop across the diode isn't exactly two volts. So the current's a little bit off. I could adjust this resistor to make it closer to 100 milliamps if I wanted. And because that's about it. If I want to know beta, I can find the current in right here, IB. I know IC. The ratio ideally is beta is equal to IC over IB. And that's not exactly true in this case. Since I'm saturated, I know the beta is at least that large. How much more it is, I don't know. So this ratio tells me that the beta, what's this? That's about 2 milliamps, 93. Beta is at least 42. How much more it is, I don't know. And again, note, the 167 millivolts tells me the transistor saturated. If I were to change the circuit, um, say make this 20K, then what happens is there's just not enough base current and the transistor enters the active region. So if here's your load line, I used to have beta IBs up here. And what happens is then I saturate, I move up the load line, I can't go beyond 0.2 volts. So I saturate. If I lower this, now I can achieve that current. And what happens is IB goes down, IC goes down, and VCE goes up. Right now, VC is 5.2 volts. What that tells me is I'm in the active region. What that tells me is this is going to get hot. That's when you get the burn marks in your circuit board that look like this. I'm in the active region. Um, and to fix that, I need more base current. I've got to take R1, make it smaller to get more base current. That pushes me up the load line till I'm saturated. And hardware, I can build that. If I build it in hardware, so there's my transistor. Here's my 5 volts coming in. 5 volt going through 1K. Here's my resistor going from 5 volts through resistor 
to an LED to the collector. Collector goes to emitter to ground. So there's my path to ground. Here's the base. If I build that circuit, I can measure the voltage at the base or collector. At the collector, it's 0.318 volts. Again, that's 0.2 volts ish, close to zero, but not quite, telling me this transistor saturated. And if I compare the voltages and currents, what I calculate is different than what I simulated, different than what I measured in hardware. That's really typical in electronics. I'm going to get three different answers. The calculations use ideal diode models. Diodes aren't ideal. The point two is pulled out of thin air, close to, th close to zero volts, but not quite. Simulator says it should be 0.16. Hardware says 0.318. This is the actual answer. That's what it's really doing. So again, you're going to get similar answers if you're doing it right, but they will be different. So that's turning on and off an LED with electronics. If I take this guy right here, I take this one right here. This is the base. If I disconnect that, the LED turns off. Reconnected, LED turns on. So with just a little bit of base current, I can turn on and off the LED. I can do the same thing with a speaker. If I have something really wimpy over here, say again a pick, a uh, 555 timer, it can do 0 volts, 5 volts just fine, but it can only do up to 25 milliamps. With a speaker, I've got a problem. 5 volts at 8 ohms is 625 milliamps. I can't drive 625 milliamps with a pick or a 555 timer. Come up with electronic switch that does let me drive it. Well, again, that's a transistor. In this case, I need to use the 6144 NPN transistor. The reason being is that's more than 200 milliamps. If I use a 3904, I'll blow the transistor. So let's use the 6144. Um, to power it, I just go 5 volts through the 8 ohm speaker to transistor to ground. If the transistor is turned on, I'll have 5 minus 0.2 over 8 ohms, 600 milliamps. If the transistor is turned off, I'll have zero milliamps. Find RB to saturate this. To find IB, I first take this, divide by beta. The beta for a 6144 transistor is between 200 and 500. Do the worst case. It's at least 200. So make that divide by 200. Gives me three milliamps. Pick IB to be at least 3 milliamps and less than 25 milliamps. I chose 4.3, just a kind of number out of full air, out of thin air. The resistance then is your 5 minus 0.7, 4.3 volts over IB, 1000 ohms. That's kind of why I chose this, it gives me a nice number. And that 1000 isn't critical. As long as the current's more than 3 milliamps, less than 25, it'll work. Checking the answer in Circuit Lab. In Circuit Lab, if I build it, if this is zero volts, it's really easy. At zero volts, this turns off, current turns off, everything's off. Off is actually kind of a gimme. The hard one is at five volts. When this is five volts, this should be 0.7. And I'm really measuring it's actually 0.7502. There is no 6144 transistor, so I had to pick something close, like a TIP41. Change beta to be 300. That matches what I'm assuming. Run it, and I get 0 0.7502 for VB. VC is 5.25 volts. And D -d 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 -d. that's about it. So what that's telling me right here, this is not saturated, it's in the active region. If I change beta to be 300, it should be saturated. And hardware, I can check it. And again, in hardware, what I'll do is I'll take the base resistor uh, right here and tie it either to 5 volts right here 
or at zero volts. When it's tied at zero volts, the transistor should turn off. At five volts, it should turn on. <coughs> I've got the speaker going from five volts to the speaker to the collector. Emitter is tied to ground. So there's the emitter. Here's the collector. When I tie that to five volts, the voltage I see at the collector is 0 0.086. So what that tells me is that I'm saturated. Close to zero, but not quite. I assume 0.2. Again, pulled out of thin air. It's actually 0.086. And again, if you set up a table, my calculations are different than simulation, different than hardware. This is the simulation result when I change beta to 300, and it does saturate. There's the base current, collector current, BBE. Again, everything looks good. Once it works at DC, I can now do something like, instead of taking this, tying it straight to 5 volts and ground, tie it to a 555 timer. Okay, to illustrate that, here I've got a 555 timer being powered by the, one of the breadboards that we use in electronics. Its output on pin 3 goes to a 1K resistor to a 6144 transistor. The collector of the transistor, I've got 5 volts going through an ammeter to your 12 ohm resistor LED to collector. Then the emitter goes to ground. When the 555 timer outputs 5 volts, it turns on the LED, drawing 136 milliamps. When it outputs 0 volts, it turns off the LED. That's an electronic switch. I'm using the transistor to take something wimpy, like a 555 timer, and turn on and off something that needs some power, like an LED. Same thing works with a speaker. I now have a speaker connected, and you can hear the speaker popping up and down when the switch is closed. It draws 170 milliamps, switch open, draws zero. I actually added a 20 ohm resistor in series with the speaker just because my regulator can't handle 600 milliamps. And you can kind of see the speaker, you can definitely hear it. That's the speaker being turned on and off. Replace the capacitor with one smaller, that ups the frequency. And that's what the transistor does for you. It takes something really wimpy and turns it into a nice, loud, annoying speaker. That was annoying enough. And as a note, you can, this for an NPN transistor, there's kind of two different ways to connect it. In digital electronics, you always connect the emitter to ground. What that does is VN is now relative to ground. At 5 volts, it saturates. At 0 volts, it turns off. When it's saturated, say this is 1 milliamp, I allow beta times that. If beta is 200, this allows up to 200 milliamps to flow. That's digital electronics. In 321 analog electronics, we take the load and move it down to the emitter. The reason being is if this is 5 volts, this is 0.7 volt drop across the diode, this is 4.3 volts. As the base voltage goes up and down, the emitter voltage goes up and down. That allows you to output a nice clean sine wave on the emitter, say the speaker. That's what we need for analog electronics. Digital electronics, I want it to be full on or full off. If you look at the transistor, in this case it's either off or saturated. In this case, it's actually active. So this is going to get hot. That's where you need the heat sink. That's why you have things like the 6144 transistor designed to dissipate heat. So this is going to change but that'll be in a different course. Analog electronics, we move the load to the emitter. In digital electronics, we keep it at the collector. If I want to turn on and off a 10 volt source with a five volt output, I can do that with an NPN transistor. So again, if this point is grounded, the PNP is turned on. If this point is floating, there's no current flow, the PNP is turned off. To turn this on and off, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my multimeter. To turn that on and off, I use an NPN transistor. So here, 5 volts turns on the NPN. When that's turned on, this is 0.2 volts. Turns on the PNP. And I have about 9.8 volts right here. I get a 0.2 volt drop. When the input is 0 volts, this is off. If it's off, there's no current flow. And this is off. 
so I can turn on and off my load, connecting it to 10 volts or 0 volts using a PNP, but I'll need to use an NPN as well to turn that on and off. So it can be done, just takes two transistors. Typically in 320 electronics, we just use an NPN, got to start somewhere. For the PNP, I can check that in Circuit Lab, apply 10 volts in, apply a DC 5 volt source, see if that turns it on. I can measure the voltage of V1. V1 is 24 millivolts, 0.024 volts. It should be 0.2 volts when saturated. It's really close to zero, really is saturated. Here is 10 volts on this side. I should have a 0.2 volt drop across the transistor. And it says V2 is 9.87, 9.78 volts. So that's actually 0.22 volt drop, about like what we expected. So this is turned on. If I make V0 0 volts, it turns off and V2 is zero. Now, one thing you can do with transistors, you can fake analog outputs. So suppose I want to vary the brightness of an LED from 0% to 100% on. Well, I can do 100% on with the transistor. I can do 0% on with the transistor. If I want to do 10% on, what I can do is turn on the transistor 10% of the time, turn it off for 90%, or 50% or 90% on. This way I can fake analog outputs with the digital output. And that is done. If you watch cars, the taillights do this. Normally when you turn on your lights, the taillights might be 10% on. When you hit the brakes, they go to 90% on. They get brighter. And if you turn your head really quickly, you can see the lights flashing. That's the pulse width modulation. This is something that's done on taillights. That's done on scoreboards. I only have to have one set of wires going to the LEDs on the scoreboard and using software. I can change how bright the different colors are, change the color on the scoreboard. I can control the speed of motors using pulse width modulation. So this is a really common trick to vary speeds with the binary output. And I can do that with, say, a 555 timer. This is a 555 timer, and what this part does, this is your variable pulse width. So I can do a pulse that looks like this, or like that, you know, vary the on-off on cycles. With this guy right here, slid all the way to the right, or all the way to the left. I charge through 1K, uh, discharge through 50K. So it's barely on. Slide it all the way the other way. I charge through 51K, discharge right away. That varies the duty cycle. Um, that's at V3. V3 then turns on and off an NPN transistor. When this is turned on, the LEDs turn off. When it's zero volts, it turns it off. So there I have my brightness control. Uh, one thing to note about power transistors, sometimes they're Darlington pairs. For example, the TIP112 is actually Darlington pair. What that means is I have two transistors in the package. Um, what it does kind of creates a big Hagen transistor. The reason for that is uh, TIP112 has a gain of 1,000 and a current capability of 3 amps or 4 amps. And it's really hard to do that with a single transistor. So what they do is they cascade two of them. The second one has a high current capability. The first one provides the high gain. To analyze it, uh, just for simplicity, let's assume beta is the same in both, both transistors. The voltage based emitter sees two diodes. So VBE is 1.4 volts. When I, for the current gain in the active region, if this is one, this current is beta, so that's one plus beta, times another beta gives you beta times one plus beta, or essentially beta squared. So if each one has a gain of, say, 30, together it has a gain of 900. The odd thing about the Darlington pairs is when I saturate it, I can't get to 0.2. This is a diode. This is always at least 0.7 volts. If this one saturates, then I have 0.7 plus 0.2, makes that 0.9 volts. For a Darlington pair, the lowest you can get the voltage is 
Darlington pairs are not really designed for digital electronics. They're more for analog. But you can use them for digital electronics. Just have to realize that when you saturate it, I don't get down to 0.2. I can only get down to about 0.9 volts. And if I use that for a speaker, this is capable of 4 amps, which is good. Gain is 1,000, which is good. But when I saturate, it's 0.9 volts. So 5 volts across an 8-ohm speaker gives you 5 minus 0.9 over 8, 5 12 milliamps, a little bit less. But the base current needs to be that divided by 1,000, 0.5 milliamps or more. So I could say let's just make IB 1 milliamp, making this 3.6K. And where that comes from is 5 minus 1.4. For a Darlington pair, the voltage drop across the diode is 1.4 volts, because there's really two diodes right here giving you 3.6 kilo ohms. In Circuit Lab, Circuit Lab has Darlington pairs. That's this symbol. If I simulate it, you can see that BC right here is 0.9044 volts. Again, the reason it's not 0.2 is because this is a diode that has to be 0.7 plus 0.2, about 0.9 volts when you saturate. And that's what Circuit Lab is saying. And with the transistor, you can annoy your friends and neighbors. That's kind of what, like this is doing. Nice loud sound. And it really doesn't matter what the load is. LED, transistor, motor, whatever. Now, the one oddity is with motors, you kind of have to take into account the inductance. Like suppose I want to turn on and off a motor. If the motor draws 30 milliamps at 24 volts when being loaded, or when being run, a 2904 should work, but if I connect this to the motor, it keeps on blowing. So why is that? Well, the reason is inrush current. When I start a motor, the motor is stationary. I've got to build up the inertia in the motor. That takes energy. That's the inrush current. Another way to think about it is a motor has back EMF. When stationary, there's no back EMF, nothing to stop the current flow, so there's a big inrush current. As the motor speeds up, the back EMF blocks the voltage, or I'm not drawing any more current because I don't have to add any more rotational energy. In steady state, I have very little current draw. And you can think about that as an energy balance. Power in equals power out. As the motor's spinning, if it's spinning freely, there's no load, so the current should be zero. There's a little bit of friction, so there's a little bit of current flow. That's your steady state. That's like your 20 milliamps. On startup, however, it might be a huge amount of current, like 10 amps. That 10 amps is killing the transistor. That's inrush current, a feature of motors. A couple ways to, to prevent that is, one, I add a resistor in series. This is typically done on large motors. On large motors, you can't just connect them to, to 72 volts DC directly. It'll burn out the windings. What I have to do is limit the current, get the motor up to speed. Then I can get rid of that resistance. Another option is I can change the profile. Rather than asking for 24 volts right off the bat, or 40 volts right off the bat, I ramp up the voltage. That gives the motor a little bit of time to speed up, get up to speed, keeps the inrush current down, saves the motor. But for larger motors, you can't just connect them directly. A second thing about motors is motors have inductance. If you look at an inductor, the voltage across an inductor is LDIDT. So suppose I take an inductor connected to a battery, so your 12-volt battery in your car, get current flowing through it, then suddenly I disconnect the, the power supply. The current suddenly goes to zero. The voltage goes to infinity. Again, if this is the current, it does that. The voltage is LDIDT, becomes the slope. In this case, goes to minus infinity. That infinite voltage will fry your transistor. What's happening is I've got energy in the magnetic field. As the magnetic field collapses, the energy has to go somewhere it will create whatever voltage it takes 
to dissipate the energy. And in cars, that path to ground is through your spark plug. That's how you generate sparks with a car. Um, so for cars, that's good. For transistors, that's bad. If I just have a motor and I turn it on, turn it off, turn it off, turn it, turn it off, it might work a couple times, but very quickly the transistor dies. And what's happening is this will generate, you know, maybe a thousand volts. Whatever it takes to find a path to ground, the path to ground is through your transistor, that fries it. To save the transistor, you need a flyback diode. What this does is this limits the voltage to less than 12.7 volts. If I try to get a thousand volts across this, the diode turns on, saves the transistor. Normally that diode is turned off, it's 12 volts to ground, backwards through a diode. Normally that has no operation. All that does is that when I have current flowing through the inductor, when the switch opens, it now has a path to continue the current, or it limits the voltage to 12.7. So that, in summary, is using a transistor as a switch. It's like a mechanical switch. If I can find it, here it is. It's kind of electronic version of a mechanical switch. Open, closed, open, closed. Except that instead of mechanics, it's all electronics. The beauty of that is it doesn't break. You can do this millions of times and the transistor's just fine versus mechanical switches. After about 10,000 actuations, the switch burns out or wears out. The electronic switches can change very, very fast. Again, one megahertz is totally possible with electronic switches. And they also let you interface electronics to your switch. So something like a 555 timer, which can output 5 volts at less than 25 milliamps, can turn on and off your load, be it a speaker, be it a light, be it a motor, whatever you like. All you have to do is make sure that beta IB is more than IC, and on the load line, I've got a load line for this resistor. On the x-axis, it's 5 volts. On the y-axis, it's 5 over 8 ohms, 625 milliamps. When I saturate, I want to demand more than 625 milliamps. I want beta IB to be more than your max IC. When I do that, what happens is I move up the load line. I can't go beyond zero because that produces energy. Physically, that's impossible. I can't quite get to zero because switches aren't perfect. So I saturate at about 0.2 volts-ish. And then I have a switch that's turned on. So that is lecture number 12 for ECE320, using a transistor as a switch.